Friends, what do you say we get started? Uh, Welcome this morning again to God's great gift to us of being able to gather and be in the Word of God together and to study, learn, and grow. Uh, You might be sick of me saying this, but I'm going to just keep on saying it until we turn blue in the face. And that is, what a gift that we get to hear God talk to us today in His Word, the Bible. Uh, Today, more than ever, we need to remember that the Bible is not just some old dusty book. It's not just some religious suggestions that have been passed down from generation to generation. But what do we believe about the Bible? That it is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. So every time we open its pages and we read the words, it's God himself speaking into our hearts and our minds. And so think about this. We get to gather and hear God talk to us today. We get to hear, have God himself teach us uh, through his word. I think that's pretty special, don't you? Uh, so I always love just to start each study with just being grateful and thankful that we can gather here still in this country uh, in a safe place and study the Word of God, and be able to learn and grow together in it. So uh, we are in the book of Hebrews. We're marching through this book. And I'm going to warn you today, man, we've got some tough stuff to slug through. Uh, It's some difficult sledding as we talk today about the priesthood and about Jesus being superior to Melchizedek. Uh, This is going to be hard for us in our Western minds to get a grip of what this is really all about. Remember, the author of Hebrews was writing to Jewish Christians who had a really wonderful understanding of the Old Testament, which you and I have a whole different understanding of the Old Testament, right? So he's going to come at it from a different perspective than you and I are used to. So we're going to have to work hard today to try and wrap our minds around what it means that Jesus is superior to Melchizedek. What did it mean to them? And what does it still mean for us that he is superior to that old priestly sacrificial system? So I warned you ahead of time, we're going to make you think today. You got your thinking caps on? Maybe we should pray and make sure God's with us, shall we? All right, let's do that. Oh, gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word uh, that we study today, that inspired in Aaron in word and so grateful to know that you're going to speak us today through it and ask that you would bless us in our study today that all of our words would be your words and that you would especially help us by your spirit today through some difficult things and uh, some different way of seeing things and understanding things that through it all uh, we might see how you're still working through that word to give us all we need for life and the living of it. And all is said and done, Lord, let it be about just being thankful and grateful for your son Jesus who was superior in every way, has fulfilled all of the Old Testament uh, to prepare, to forgive our sins and prepare a place in heaven for each of us. So to that end, we pray that you be with us as we study, learn, and grow together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, y'all, if you want to get your Bibles out, I always like to read it first and then sort of get at it verse by verse. So today, we're in Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. And we'll go through 5, verse 10. You all ready? Here we go. Therefore, okay, now I have to stop already. See, one word and I have to stop myself. (laughs) Whenever we see therefore, what do we always ask ourselves? What's it there for? (laughs) <laughs> right? So that we always say, this is, this is now the author is going to connect everything that has gone before this to what's coming up next. It's like he said, all right, we've already talked about all of that. Now, what does that have to do with what's coming next? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men, and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal generously with those who are ignorant and are going astray, 
since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And, he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the day of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And this is the oh-so-clear Word of God. <laughs> Thanks be to God. All right, so if you want to look at your sheet, let's start off with just sort of an introductory, an introductory paragraph to get our minds and thoughts uh, where we're going. All right, so um, in writing to the Jewish Christians who were tempted to revert to Judaism to avoid persecution the writer of Hebrews urged them to be decisive in the today that was confronting them. So let's just stop and make sure we're clear. This is kind of me reviewing what we've talked about already. Remember, the purpose that the author of Hebrews was writing for was that there were a lot of Christians who were feeling the persecution and were saying, you know, it might just be a lot easier for us if we went back to our old Jewish ways. Because the Jews weren't under persecution, but the Christians were. So the author writes to encourage them to stay strong, to not give up or abandon Jesus, or to think that there's really no difference between the old Jewish ways and the new ways of Christ. So he's writing this whole book to help them to see how important it is to see Jesus as the ultimate, as the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises. Remember all that, everybody? Even if you don't just nod your head like this, I'll be real happy. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. So reading on, they needed to know that they were thinking of leaving the one who was superior in every way to the religious system of Judaism, as vital as that had been for Israel. He, meaning Jesus, or the author, I mean, had shown the superiority of Jesus over the prophets. We've already talked about that here in this class. As God's spokesman, uh, uh, prophets as God's spokesman, he's revealed Jesus' superiority over the angels as mediators of the ceremonial laws of the covenant. We've already talked about that in this class, haven't we? All right, again, just nod your head. Yes, I remember. Thank you. He's already talked about how Jesus is even superior than Moses in their respective persons and positions as a servant in God's house, as a son over God's house. So here's where I wanted to stop and then just check out this sheet again. Have the other pastors been doing your outline with you as you've been going through this? Sort of. All right, well, if you want to pull that out again, all right, we're just kind of reviewing where we've been in the author. So you can see that, you know, if you're looking at the outline of the book of Hebrews here, that verses 1, 1 through 3, you see that top part was just sort of an introduction and then he gets into the meat of his point. And then you see these four boxes in the bottom, right? This, all four of these boxes represent a chunk of the book of Hebrews. And each chunk is to try and convince the reader that Jesus is superior in every way to something. Chapters 1 and 2, the author convinced us that Jesus is superior to the angels in the Torah. Chapters 3 and 4, he convinced us that Jesus is superior to Moses and the promised land, the whole Exodus event. Chapters 5 and 7, this is where we find ourselves today. He's going to try and convince us that Jesus is superior to the priests, the whole priesthood, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, and this representative priest that we're going to learn about named Melchizedek. 
then still coming for us in the future, he's going to, when we get to chapters 8, 9, and 10, he's going to try and convince us that Jesus is superior to the sacrifice and the covenant. All right, so are you clear where we are in all of this? Today, we find ourselves in that third little chunk, chapters 5 and 7, end of chapter 4 and beginning of chapter 5, as we'll talk about the priesthood in Melchizedek. Does that help everybody? So you kind of have a, you know, you're pinning it into the whole structure of where we're moving and what we're doing, where we're moving and grooving. All right, so back to your original sheets. This next sentence, in urging them to be decisive in the today that was confronting them, he had reminded them that God's word is living and active. It is so penetrating that it judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart and lays everything bare before the eyes of him to whom we must all give an account. Again, we've talked about that verse in the past. Since no one can face that truth without having a sense of sin and a need awakened in him, he then reminded his readers again of how God has graciously dealt with our sin and filled our deepest need in Jesus Christ. So there you have a good review of where we've been so far. Now, in today's study, He's going to point to the one who, as God's own high priest, in reverent submission to his Father's gracious will, this high priest suffered on our behalf and became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Consistent with the pattern of his letter, he compares this high priest with all the high priests of Judaism. See, so that's where we're going to go today. And you heard this in our readings Right? He looks at how the high priests were appointed, how the high priests served. This is something they were all familiar with, and he's going to show how Jesus does that and so much more, how he is the completion, the fulfillment of that whole system. All right? Thoughts or questions or we're going to dig right in. Anybody? All right, well, let's start thinking of verses 14 through 16, which we already read. So what does it say to us that Jesus is called the high priest who has gone through the heavens? Did you see that? Verse 14. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, what does that mean, gone through the heavens? Anybody know there's a special day in the church we celebrate this event? I heard somebody whisper it. It's Ascension Day, right? Ascension Day. And what is the event that we celebrate on Ascension Day every year? The time when Jesus ascended where? To Lambeau Field in Green Bay? No. Where did he ascend to? The heavens, right? We say he ascended to heaven, but really he ascended into the heavens. You know, that word heavens See, our idea of heaven and the biblical word for heaven is two separate things. The Greek word for heavens is uranois. And, and the heaven, for when we say heaven, if we were to ask someone, where's heaven, what would almost everybody do? They'd point up. <laughs> that is not what uranois, the heavens, mean. The heavens is the atmosphere that is all around us. The heavens is the air that we breathe. The heavens really is this, this sort of space in which God exists. And there is no space that God doesn't exist. So the heavens is everywhere that God is. Right? Does that make sense? So to say that Jesus ascended into the heavens really means that on Ascension Day, his physical body was taken away from us so that he could be present in the heavens with us all over the place. Hmm. Can you repeat that? Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just explain. Sometimes we think on Ascension Day that Jesus went away from us. That is actually the exact opposite of what happened. On Ascension Day, Jesus became closer to every single one of us. Because think about it. If he was still here in his physical body, if Jesus was a person still here in a physical body like you and I, how many people could talk to him at once? One. Yeah, one person, a one-to-one -one conversation. Or one. If you wanted to see Jesus, you would have to make an appointment 
with the other million believers here on earth to get a chance. It'd be harder than seeing your doctor is what I'm saying, right? (laughs) See, but that's not, he knew he needed to be closer to us and more available to us and more present with us. So ascension, he ascends his physical body into the heavens and he becomes present everywhere at all times for each and every one of us. So always, I always say he ascended uh, so that he, he went away so that he could come closer. Does that make sense? He went away so that he could come closer. Yeah. Many, many times in the Bible, it mentions meeting Jesus in the clouds. Mm-hmm. So I have a tendency to want to look at, out a window at the clouds when I'm praying. It just feels like there he is. Uh, I guess I should be feeling he's just right there around me. I mean, I underlined that because of an experience I had. Sure. And so, therefore, I yeah. found all the places where you meet him in the clouds. So that is I would like to say that, if you couldn't hear what she said, that the Bible talks a lot about seeing Jesus, meeting Jesus in the clouds. And the, the cloud is not a literal form of vapor, water, that's floating around up in the sky, that's here today and gone tomorrow. That's a cloud that we would see, meteorologically speaking, a cloud, right? But the cloud is a symbol for the presence of God. So think about Mount Sinai. When when God uh, was on Mount Sinai and he's giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, the people looked up at the mountain and they saw what? A cloud that enveloped the the mountain. See, the cloud isn't... It's really just the symbol, that Old Testament word is a Shekinah, that presence of God on a hill. So the cloud is never a literal, that's where Jesus is. The cloud is always a symbol of the presence of God. And so the whole idea, again, of sky, of cloud, of heaven, it, the biblical concept of that is the, the atmosphere that is all around us. So to meet Jesus in the clouds means to meet Jesus, as you said, right here with you, in the air that you breathe, in the atmosphere in which you live. So on the last day, exactly, he's just going to pop up right here? That's a great question. She asked, on the last day, then, is he just going to pop up? Because, again, it talks about Jesus coming from the clouds. Right? Now, again, think about that. If Jesus came from the cloud... What if he came like in China? Would you see him here in the United States? You wouldn't, because it's the other side of the world. But if the cloud is a symbol of the everything, the atmosphere in which we live, you know, when Jesus ascends out of the clouds, who's going to be able to see him? Everybody. All people at the same time. You know, so again, you can't think cloud is a literal... It's a symbol for the presence of God, the heavens. Or maybe, I'll get you in a second, Roger, maybe one more way to look at this. We say this in the creed. He ascended into heaven, and then what comes next? And sits at the right hand of God the Father. I ask you, where's the right hand of God the Father? A lot of people would do this again. They would point up as if there is a a chair somewhere in a place in the space that God sits and Jesus is right there at his right side. That's not what the right hand of God is. In the Bible, the right hand is where's the right hand of God? Everywhere. At all places and all times. So when he ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, that means he's where? He's everywhere. Now see, this is what I said. You and I, as Western people, we have to work this text Because when it says here in verse 14, therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, they all know what this means. They all know that the author is saying, oh, Jesus, the man who was walking here among us, is now everywhere. He is around us and surrounds us. He's not like the high priest that we have in Jerusalem who sits in a chair in the temple. But we have a high priest who is in the heavens, everywhere with us. They see it differently, hear it differently than we do. All right, Roger, I'm sorry. Yes, he is omnipresent. But so is Jesus. 
And that ascension day is when he became omnipresent. Pastor Peterson, some of you remember Pastor Lorman Peterson here, one of our pastors, wrote a book called The Cloud of God. I don't know if it got published either. Do you remember reading it or? You wrote a little introductory paragraph for it, huh? We'll have to pull that out and see what he had to say about it. We'll have to look. He gave me a whole bunch of his manuscripts when he, when he retired, so I have an old file to pile through, I guess. All right, so do you see how cool this is? This one verse, a high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. That's a powerful statement right from the start, isn't it? All right, number two. Now that we just blow all your, blew all your minds, right? <laughs> how does knowing that God's own high priest was tempted in every way, excuse me, that's what it said going on. Verse 14, he, uh, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So my thought is, how does that just bring us such great comfort to know that our high priest Jesus right, was tempted in every way? And how does that enable us to approach the throne of grace with confidence? When you come to Jesus, how does it help you come to him knowing that he's been tempted in every way. Go ahead. Because he fully understands because he's been there. She said, because he fully understands because he's been there. Isn't that true? Right? There's nothing that you've experienced that Jesus hasn't experienced. So when you come to him, you don't have to think, well, he's not going to understand this. He's God. He's way different than me. He's not going to understand how this hurts. He's not going to understand what grief feels like. And we forget sometimes that, remember he's standing at the tomb of Lazarus, his best friend who was dead and buried for four days, and everyone around him is weeping and crying in their grief. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, oh, stop being such babies? What does he do? He cries with them. He didn't just cry to show something. He cried because he felt something. Loss, grief, the sting of death. That's the God we come to. So when we come in our grief, Jesus says, I know I've been there. Or when we come when our bodies ache, you know, we, we say, you, God don't know what it's like to hurt. You've never been a human. Jesus says, oh, yes, I do. I'll tell you what it's like to hurt. Have you ever been whipped? You ever had a crown of thorns pressed on your head? Have you ever fasted for 40 days and your stomach was grumbling and groaning? He says, I know what it's like to hurt. When we say, my friends are driving me crazy, <laughs> you can never understand, God, what it's like to have friends like this. Jesus says, oh yeah? Did your friends betray you? Did your friends sell you for 30 pieces of silver? He knows. He's been tempted in every way. You say, well, the devil's really working on me. God, you don't know what that's like because you're God. Jesus says, oh yeah? You remember that time in the wilderness when Satan was working on me? I know what it's like. Tempted in every way. That's the God we pray to. Not some really weird force that we can't understand. Not some mystical God power like Mother Nature or some spirit of the tree or the nature around us, you know. We pray to a human who was tempted in every way just as we are. But let's not forget the next part. What does it say? He was tempted in every way just as we are. But what comes right after that? But was without sin. So that's my next part of this question. How does knowing Jesus, though tempted, was without sin, also encourage us to approach the throne of grace with confidence? When we come to him with our worries, you know, he's not going to say, man, I, I don't know how to do that either. I don't know how to get past that. I don't know how to avoid that temptation. Now, when that happened to me, I fell. <laughs> That's never what God's going to say, what Jesus is going to say, right? Because he was able to go through the temptation without sinning. So when we come to him, we come to one who knows and who, who has done it, who never sinned, who can speak to us as God, not as just another person. 
So we see him as a human and we see him as a God in this one little statement. He has tempted in every way yet was with us. That's the God we pray to. Marty? Did you say just a couple sentences ago that we're praying to man because, because God came down as man? He's a man. So, so I wouldn't say we pray to men, but we pray to Jesus in his human form and we pray to Jesus in his divine form because they're one and the same. But we don't pray to men or people. Okay, I thought you said that we pray to Jesus who was a man. Was a man. Correct, we do. Okay, well then I got it messed up. <laughs> Sorry if I misled you there. That's right. And what is your definition? We're studying about the priest. What is your definition of a priest? We're going to get to that. Oh. We're going to talk a whole lot about the priests in a minute. Okay. So hold that thought. All right. Yes. Okay. And I don't feel that I can go to him because I didn't resist. So that's the law working on your heart, which is a good thing. <laughs> we need that, the law to convict us. We can't do it on our own. We can't possibly make this on our own. So please don't stop there. Yes. The law drives you to your knees, right? It, it makes you do what you just said, cry out, I'm helpless. I feel bad. I can't do it. Then what's the next step? Lord, help me. Forgive my sin. Lord, help me do what I can't do on my own. God, give me the Holy, power, Holy Spirit power to accomplish what I cannot do on my own. So it's good that you feel that, but don't stop there, please. I do it. Well, yeah, that's what I do it. Yeah, for sure. Jesus loves the weak. Jesus loves the weak, uses the weak, died for the weak. All of us. Yes, Arlo. The phrase, throne of grace. Uh-huh. That is the throne of God. All right, so here's why you're making me pause. He's talking about the throne of grace that I used in my sheet. I don't think that it's ever a phrase that's used in the Bible. I don't recall ever throne of grace being used in the Bible. That's just kind of my, my interpretation of that when we come to God in his grace and his goodness, I don't know. That's just a phrase I use. It's right here. It, okay, it is. So there you go. Thank you. Yeah, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. God's throne. Yeah, it's, it, but again, it's, remember, the throne of God isn't a local place. So the throne of grace is everywhere. It's just, it's just a symbol this, of coming to God in his gracious goodness. So it's not like a place in space where there's a seat that God's sitting on his throne because his throne is everywhere. Uh huh. Yes. Right. He's not far away. He's right here with us. But sometimes we pray like he's far away. Like, God, I, I need to get your attention right now. You got a second? <laughs> you know, I'm, we, I'm right here, God. Even though he already is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right, so point of the throne of grace thing is we can approach it with confidence. We can approach God's grace with confidence because he was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. All right, so the communicator's commentator in the bottom of your first page said this, Our priest is not so lofty or so separated that he is incapable of understanding our human situation. He is one who is totally familiar with it Having been tempted at every turn of the road just as we have been, he can laugh and weep with us about life's foibles and pain because he has been through it all, yet without falling before any of it. 
So that last sentence really works for me. He has been through it all, yet without falling before any of it. So, top the gospel assurance given here is that when we approach the throne of grace with confidence, today we will receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And that allows us to begin enjoying our Sabbath rest as Christians already in the here and now. Beautiful. Now let's talk about Melchizedek, shall we? So remember, the point of this section, the reader is going to try and get us to see that Jesus is superior to any priest that has ever been before. You name it. The high priest, Caiaphas, that was present in that day, or even the ultimate high priest spoken in the Old Testament, Melchizedek. So look at number three. As the writer talks about the high priest of Judaism, what contrast is immediately apparent when you hear this? They deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, and then contrast that with Jesus, the high priest, who was able to sympathize with our weaknesses. There's a real subtle difference here, and yet it's really super important. The priests could deal with people who were struggling with sin. And if we read, remember we read it said that they had to offer sacrifices for themselves also. Do you see? Because they were also sinful. They were in the same boat as the people with whom they are sharing with. The same people that they're sacrificing for. They could deal gently with them because they knew themselves what it was like to be a sinner. So they came gently as they together shared the sin and the need to have the sacrifice. Jesus, however, sympathizes with the weakness. Do you see the difference? He sympathizes. That means he hasn't gone through it himself. He hasn't experienced it himself, but he walks with us. He sympathizes with us. You know the word sympathize comes from to feel. Uh, to feel for another, right? To have sympathy for someone is to feel for them. So Jesus feels our pain, even though he's never experienced sin, he sympathizes with us in our sin. So there's a difference, again. See how superior Jesus is. He doesn't have to sacrifice for his own sins, so instead he sympathizes with us in our sin. Good? So the paragraph. Israel's high priest, here's another distinction he makes, did not take this honor of being high priest on themselves. It was the Lord who appointed the tribe of Levi in the beginning to provide those who would serve in this house. You remember your Old Testament? The Levites, the tribe of Levi, God said to Moses, will serve as the priests for the other 11 tribes. One tribe would dedicate their firstborn son who would serve as a priest to minister to all the other tribes. The Levitical order, we call it, the priesthood of the Levites. So it was the Lord who appointed the tribe of Levi to provide for those who serve, and it was the Lord who appointed Aaron, who was of the tribe of Levi, to serve as the first high priest, who was then succeeded by his son. So do you see my point? It was God who appointed the high priests. They didn't appoint themselves. It wasn't anyone else. They were appointed by God. Reading on, uh, by Jesus' time, however, you know what's coming next, don't you? Sad. By Jesus' time, the office of high priest had been politicized, and the principle of the Lord's selection had been perverted. If you know anything about your history, you'll know that Annas had arranged to be appointed to the office of high priest by Quirinius, who was Caesar of Rome, right? The Roman governor in 6 AD. He wasn't appointed by God. He wasn't appointed by the people. He was appointed by Rome. It was a political appointment. And because of that, he paid money to get it. And because of that, he was indebted to it. He was Caesar's puppet. And then he had been succeeded by his son Caiaphas, who then was also succeeded uh, by his son-in-law, Annas. So do you see how the author is taking this thing of the priests that you know today have been 
appointed not by God, but through other political shady means. Now what happens next? Not Jesus. The writer of Hebrews dealt with the principle of God's appointment of high priests, and then he quotes these two messianic psalms. You saw it in your Bible, right? If you look at verse 5 and 6, do you see how those words in your Bible are centered, not justified in the margin? You know, that's how you know it's an Old Testament quote, right? Right? So it's centered there, and you can see these are quotes from the Old Testament. So the author of Hebrews then quotes two Old Testament passages, and I'm reading back in my page, to show that the high priest had not assumed his priesthood on his own, but that it had been conferred on him by God according to his own plan and his own purpose. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, not Levi. His priesthood was not according to the Levitical order, nor was his high priesthood through Aaron, as all the other high priests were. The writer of Hebrews says, God said to him, you are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So again, he's trying to show them, and again, you and I miss this. They're all going, wait a minute, Jesus can't be high priest because he's not of the tribe of Levi. Everybody knows all the high priests are of the tribe of Levi. But the author of Hebrews says, this high priest is different, superior to all the others, not appointed by a Caesar in Rome, not appointed by political persuasion, not appointed because of bloodline or because a tribe of which he was born in or because of his family lineage, but was appointed by whom? God himself. And this priest would not serve the priesthood for a time, and then another priest would come after him. How long would this priest be priest for? Forever. And he is in the line of the order of Melchizedek. Now here's where we're going to pause and look at this quick little video I have. It's a four-minute video that's going to talk about who in the world is Melchizedek. And where does he come from? He only appears in the Bible one little time. And um, there's a lot that we need to learn about this guy Melchizedek. So give me a minute here. All right, so take a look at this, uh, and just remember, Melchizedek wasn't Jewish. He was a king of Shalom, which we'll look in the video, and that means he wasn't a Levite either, and yet he was called a priest in the Bible. Ooh, let that sink in your head as you think about this video. Come on now. We are walking through the story of the Bible, focusing on the role of priests. And that story begins with God creating a garden called Eden. Where heaven and earth are one. And God places humans in the garden to be his royal image, his priests, so that humans and God can work together as one. And this whole setup is called God's blessing. But tragically, the priestly humans are duped into rebelling against God and then exiled from the garden. But God promises that one day a descendant will come to defeat that evil deceiver and restore humanity as royal priests. And we learn he'll be both a priest and a sacrifice. But as it stands, humanity is outside of Eden and things have spiraled into chaotic violence. But God chooses from the wreckage a couple, Abraham and Sarah. And God calls them to journey to the land of Canaan, and he promises to give them a huge family and all the blessings of Eden. Now, the blessing isn't just for them. The goal is that God's blessing flows through their family out to all the nations. And so that makes Abraham's family like a priesthood. So is Abraham that royal priest we've been hoping for? Well, no. But Abraham does meet a mysterious figure who reminds us of that promised royal priest. And who is this? Well, Abraham is returning victorious from a risky battle. And he passes by the city of Shalem, and this king comes out to meet him. And we're told that this king is also a priest who serves the same God that Abraham does. Ah, yes, Melchizedek. This man's a mystery. We don't know why he worships Abraham's God. We don't even know his family lineage. Exactly. But here's what happens. 
Melchizedek brings this great feast out to Abraham and his army, and then he gives God's blessing to Abraham, saying, God is the one who gave him this victory over his enemies. Then Abraham gives Melchizedek one tenth of everything that he has, and that's the story. So what is it all about? Well, Melchizedek is the king and the priest of Shalem, which is an ancient name short for Jerusalem. Ah, Jerusalem, which will later become the capital of Abraham's future family, where the temple is built. And that 10% that Abraham gives Melchizedek, that's just like the 10% Israelites will later give to honor the priests who work in the temple. Exactly. And so here is Abraham, the father of the Israelites, and he's honoring a royal priesthood that existed long before Israel's temple or their priests. Ah, Melchizedek. Yeah, he's super important. And we'll come back to him when we get to the story of David. Okay, back to Abraham. We find out that he and Sarah are unable to have kids. And they're really old. So how are they going to have a family? Well, they scheme up their own plan. Sarah forces her Egyptian slave to produce a child with Abraham. But once that happens, Sarah ends up despising her slave and oppressing her. So instead of trusting God for a family, they do it on their own terms. Right. And so God eventually does give them their own son, Isaac. But then God promptly asks for the life of that son back. Abraham is called to offer up Isaac on a mountain as a sacrifice. And we're told this is a test. God's requiring Abraham to own up to his failures, to stop his scheming, and to surrender his family's future to God. Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain, build an altar, and right as Abraham is about to offer up his son, God stops him, and he provides a substitute ram that can be sacrificed in Isaac's place. And here, the narrator stops the story and starts speaking to you, the reader, saying, this is why we today say, on the mountain of Yahweh, it will be provided. The mountain of Yahweh, that's Jerusalem. That's right. And so notice in both of these stories we've looked at, Abraham is near that high place that will later be called Jerusalem. In the first story, Abraham meets a royal priest. And in the second story, God provides a substitute sacrifice that covers for the sins of Abraham's family. Yes, and both of these stories point forward to the need for a future royal priest who will also become a sacrifice for the sins of Abraham and his family. From here, Abraham's family grows to become an entire people, but they eventually end up as slaves in Egypt. And so, how can a group of slaves produce a royal priest? Exactly. And so that brings us to Moses, whose story we're going to look at next. All right. Again, what do I say? Clear and... I have to face my mouse over here. It doesn't want to cooperate. All right, so here, of all that video, here's the point I was hoping that you would connect. Something happens on this mountain, Shalem, the city, Shalem, that later becomes Jerusalem, which is where the whole author of Hebrew is talking about Jesus, this new high priest. And did you see the connection between Melchizedek, who was this priest, who was not part of the Levitical order, this priest appointed by God who would come and bless, be a blessing to Abraham, and the sacrifice that Abraham would make of Isaac, and this all happening where? On the Mount of Jerusalem, right? And so when the author says Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, he's connecting Jesus, this new high priest, to the priest who, who it brings the blessing of God and is also the sacrifice of God here in Jerusalem. Isn't that something? Right? That's the, that's the understanding that you and I don't hear when we read this 
in our Western minds that anyone who was reading this at the time it was written, the Jewish mind, would have understood the connection that the author is saying. Why is Jesus, the high priest, more superior than all of the other high priests? He's in the order of Melchizedek, not a, from the tribe of Levi, appointed by God himself to be the priest who reigns forever, and he is also the sacrifice the ram, the sacrificial offering that is given to save Isaac and all of us who believe. Wow. Huh? Right? This is the, this is the, the power of the whole idea of Melchizedek here in this super high priest. Oh, I love it. All right, so I'm on this paragraph right before question four. Melchizedek appears on the scene suddenly in the Genesis account after Abraham's rescue of Lot and the northern kings. Melchizedek came out to bless Abraham and received a tithe offering from Abraham. He was called the king of Salaam and a priest of the Most High God. He appeared this once and then was heard of no more. He is seen as the classic example of what we call a charismatic priest, one ordained directly by God, not the product of any cultic priestic, priestly system. Then quoting Psalm 110, The writer of Hebrews made the point that Jesus received his high priesthood in the same way as Melchizedek by God's own special designation. And then chapter 7, which we'll get to later, is going to expand on this. And we don't have time to talk about that today, but just know we'll be talking about Melchizedek again. So four, how did Jesus, being the order of Melchizedek, establish that he and his priesthood are superior to that of Judaism? What did we learn? Designated by God, not through a system of family or political wranglings, but by God himself. And his priesthood would last, what? Forever. Forever. All right, moving on to verses 7 to 10. Continuing why Jesus is superior to all the priests. Priests offer up prayers and petitions. So did Jesus, God's own great high priest, the Gospels often show Jesus frequently in prayer, don't they? Right? Jesus prayed all the time. In fact, John 17 is the high priestly prayer in which he prayed for his disciples and for the future church. That's you and me. Again, if we had time, we could sample through these verses, John 17, right? Uh, chapter 17, praying for us that we might be one with one another, that we might be one with God. Right? He often prayed like the priests did for the people. But listen, number five. Jesus also prayed with loud cries and tears. And what was the outcome of his prayer? So think about it. When did Jesus cry out with loud cries? When did he pray with loud cries and tears? There's two examples I can think of. And the cross, oh, definitely. The cross and Gethsemane is the other. Both times, Jesus in Gethsemane said he cried like great sweat, was like drops of blood, you know, um, cried out to God with tears, and, and he cried out on the cross, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, even though he prayed and cried out, what was the outcome? He still suffered and died, didn't he? So here's the question. How could the author of Hebrews say that God heard Jesus' prayer when the circumstances did not change for Jesus and his suffering and dying on a cross still awaited him. What do you all think? Have you ever cried out to God in prayer and he still let you suffer anyway? Does that mean God doesn't care about you? Does that mean God didn't hear your prayer? Does that mean that God doesn't want the best to come for you? None of those things. Sometimes... God allows his will to be done through our suffering, doesn't he? And that's exactly what happened for Jesus. It was through his suffering that God accomplished his plan and purpose to save the world. What if he had spared Jesus from that? Then the salvation wouldn't have come, right? But he gave him that, uh, he allowed him to suffer uh, so that his will could be done. So the paragraph under that, priests offer up sacrifices, and so did high priest Jesus, who himself was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why he came. In all of this, Jesus, God's high priest, was the fully obedient Son of God. 
He was the second Adam, the first man since Adam to be born fully in the holy image of God. Thus, as representative man and as Adam had been, Jesus won God's gracious gift of righteousness for us. Because he suffered, because he was obedient to God's will, God's will was done. So you see, everyone, there is a lesson there for you and I. We've been talking about this in our sermon series a lot lately. God often works through our obedience to accomplish his will. God often asks us to take that first step before something miraculous happens. We've been talking about faith a lot in our sermon series, haven't we? Faith is the ability to trust that I don't know where this is going, and I don't know how this is going to end, but if God is calling, if God is sending, then God is enabling me to do this, and God will work through that to accomplish his will. So when we step out in faith, when we take that risk, when we obey, as Jesus obeyed, remember the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done? When we obey, when we say those words, that's when God works. He works through our obedience, through our suffering, to accomplish his will and his purpose. And it is the same for Jesus, wasn't it? Question six, Jesus Christ is God's son. So if he's God, then in what sense did he learn obedience from what he suffered? How did Jesus learn from what he suffered? You're all looking at me like, I don't know. (laughs) I mean, he's God, right? How can he learn things? But remember, he's also human, right? And so along the way, he learned faithfulness through his suffering. See, this is the thing that happens. Maybe you've experienced this. When you go through something and you come out on the other end better or stronger or wiser, you look back and you go, oh, now I understand why God allowed that to happen. Now it makes sense. And then you say, next time it happens, God, I'm not going to doubt you. Next time, hopefully, <laughs> next time I'm going to trust. Next time I'm not going to question or doubt or, or, or cry out to you. I'm going to believe. So even Jesus found faithfulness in his obedience, it says. That's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? So in what sense was he, in quote, as it said, made perfect in his obedience? He was already perfect, right? But that perfection was experienced through his obedience. Perfection didn't, wasn't just a concept or an idea for him anymore. Now it was actually experienced. It was lived out. And again, for us, faith isn't just um, intellectual um, trusting, but it works itself out in obedience. Right? Do you see? So this is why I think it is so important. I want to look at this last verse here, chapter 5, verse 10. And once made perfect, this is talking about Jesus, what we're talking about, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who... Look at this word. Obey him. Wouldn't you think that would say for all who believe in him? But it says, salvation is given to all who obey him. Now our little Lutheran, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast ears, are going, what? We're saved by obedience? So let's chew on that. This is number seven. (laughs) Why did the writer say that Jesus became the source of salvation for all who obey him and not believe in him? Doesn't scripture say that you'll know who believes him by By, the ones who obey? Yes. Scripture says that clearly. We'll know who believes by those who obey. That comes out of belief. It does. See, this is the point. You've got it. You can't separate faith, uh, obedience, Right? Obedience and faith. You can't separate these two things. Believe and obey. You cannot separate them because they're one in the same. St. Paul compares this idea of belief and obedience to a tree that grows. And he says, if this tree is healthy, 
it will what? Produce good fruit. If the, if the, if the belief is strong, it will produce good fruit. But if the tree is not healthy, it will what? Not produce fruit. So you see, belief and obey are connected. They're just one and the same. If you believe, what will you do? You'll obey. It just works that way. And it works the opposite way too. If you don't obey, do you really believe? See, here's where I need to get on my little soapbox right now about my worry about American Christianity these days. Right, American Christianity, there's this lie out there that all you need to do to be a Christian is say, I believe. I believe in God. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. But then you just act like everybody else in the world. You follow everybody else's ways. You go with the cultural norms and values and morals. You behave like everyone else. You don't obey God. You obey culture. You obey the world. You obey your own self. And then you have to wonder, do you really believe? Do you really believe if it doesn't show up in your obedience? Or are you kidding yourself? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we just think that all I need to do is say the words, but it doesn't have to show up in my behavior. Translated, I don't have to go to church to be a believer. Well, no, you don't have to go to church but if you were a believer, what will you want to do? Go to church. I don't have to, you know, sacrifice. I don't have to put money in the offering plate. I don't have to volunteer for boards or committees. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to pray. I can worship God in the woods, in my hunting shack, my hunting sh whatever, you know. Uh, all of these things are true. But if you're a believer, what will you want to do? Do those things. Because belief and obedience are one and the same. You cannot separate the two. So that's why it's so dangerous today for folks that just say the words, but it doesn't show up in their deeds. Do their deeds save them? No. But their deeds are uh, a reflection of the salvation that's theirs. Thank you. Yes. He said, if faith and obedience are one and the same, if we disobey, have we momentarily lost our faith until we believe again? Obey again. Well, that's a great question. No, I mean, it's because you know we live in a state of grace. We are constantly and continually being forgiven, and it's not a one-to-one. -one. I don't have to confess every sin or else I'm not forgiven, because there's stuff I forget, <laughs> but I'm still forgiven for. So the answer is yes and no, isn't it? Yes, we lose our faith all the time. You know, when we disobey, when we aren't obedient, when we don't trust God, when we trust other things. But on the other hand, we're still given the gift of faith through baptism that's ours, continually comes to us, and we live in that state of grace and faith. So Luther said, we are simultaneously sinner and saint. Simul justus et peccator. So you figure that one out, how that works. How is it possible to have no faith and have full faith at the same time? How is it possible to be a sinner and a saint at the same time? It's just the way it is. He did. And if he did it, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do it too. Yeah. All right, so we're clear of this cool idea, right? Belief and obedience are one and the same. We cannot separate them just as even Jesus didn't. So finally, number eight. On what basis did God designate Jesus to be this high priest in the order of Melchizedek? Listen to what he said. Because of his reverent submission. This is verse 7, 8. Although, no, 8, 7. To the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. So he learned through his submission, through his obedience, the beauty and the strength of faith and belief. And so can you and I. The alt we have an ultimate high priest, Jesus. 
So everybody, I'm sorry, I told you that was a difficult kind of lesson today, right? To try and wrap our mind around this idea, but I hope it helped a little bit. And at least if there's one thing you grab from this, is that you see that Jesus is the ultimate superior high priest for them and also for you and me. Amen? Amen. Great. Thanks, everybody. Whew, I'm t-